Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2024. Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson titled The Beginning of the Gospel from the series on the Book of Mark, authored by Dr. Thomas R. Shepherd of Andrews University. It's scheduled for teaching on Sabbath July 6, and your reader today is Dr. Percy Harold. And to begin, we have Dr. Thomas R. Shepherd of Andrews University, the author, reading the introduction from the Sabbath School lesson pamphlet for this quarter. Thank you, Dr. Shepherd. The Gospel of Mark From the beginning of Mark, the reader knows who Jesus is. The Messiah, the Son of God. Mark 1, verse 1. However, people in the story struggle with understanding just who he is and what he is all about, except for those with demons. They know exactly who he is. The demons recognize him and wither before his mighty words. But Jesus rather consistently commands that they keep this information quiet. Why this command for secrecy? Bible students for centuries have mulled over this question. It even has a name in scholarship, the Messianic Secret. Why would a gospel want us to keep quiet about who Jesus is? What will become clear in this journey through the Gospel of Mark is that not only is there secrecy in this book, there also is amazing revelation. It can rightly be called the Revelation Secrecy Motif, and it runs through the Gospel of Mark. Although at the end of the book, all the secrecy is surprisingly replaced with a powerful revelation of Jesus. Mark can be divided into two distinct sections, halves actually. Chapter 1 through near the end of chapter 8 deals with the crucial question, who is Jesus? The answer is displayed in his teachings and his miracles. Again and again, he defeats evil, brings hope to the oppressed, and teaches compelling truths that cut to the heart of human existence. All this shouts to the reader that he is the Messiah, the Christ, whom the Hebrew people have long been awaiting. However, it is not until the middle of the book that someone not demon-possessed rightly declares who he is, thereby answering the question of the first half of the book about Christ's identity. And that person is Peter, who declares, You are the Christ. Mark 8, verse 29. The second half of Mark, from 8.30, Mark 8.31, to the end of the book, answers the question, where is Jesus going? The answer is shocking. He is going to the cross, the most ignominious and shameful manner of death in the Roman world, and is such an unexpected destination for the Messiah, who his followers think will defeat Rome and establish Israel as a powerful nation. Jesus' bumbling disciples cannot fathom what he is saying. As the book progresses, they ask less and less about this painful topic until finally they are reduced to silence in the face of the unwelcome truth. Things look gloomier and gloomier when Jesus confronts the religious leaders who plot his demise. The disciples, hopeful of a glorious kingdom, are shocked by an arrest, trial, and crucifixion that defies their expectations. But through all this, Jesus keeps a clear and consistent message of where he is going and what it means that he will die and rise again. The bread and cup of the Last Supper will represent his body and blood, Mark 14, 22-25, and he will become a ransom for many, Mark 10, 45. This does not mean he went to the cross in stoic calmness. In Gethsemane, he struggles with the decision, Mark 14, 32-42, and on the cross he cries out in despair, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mark 15.34. The Gospel of Mark shows us the darkness that Christ experienced, the cost of our salvation. But the cross is not the end of the journey. After his resurrection, he plans a meeting with his disciples in Galilee, and as we know, the Christian church began. It is a most remarkable story told in a terse, fast-moving style with little commentary from the Gospel writer himself. He simply tells the story and then lets the words, the deeds, the actions speak for themselves regarding the life and death of Jesus of Nazareth. 
And so we thank Dr. Thomas R. Shepard, Doctor of Philosophy and Doctor of Public Health, who is a Senior Research Professor of New Testament at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. He and his wife, Sherry, have two grown children and six grandchildren. May God bless us as we continue with this series of lessons this quarter. Sabbath afternoon, June 29. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new quarter, this series of lessons written about the book of Mark. And as we study them, as we open your word, we pray that it will jump out at us, that it will speak to us, and that your Holy Spirit will guide us in our understanding, that we may see the lovely Jesus, the message he has for us, and the message he has for us to pass on to those around us, whether they be family or friends or neighbours. Lord, we just pray that everyone who's listening, wherever they are in the world today, may be blessed from the reading of this Sabbath school lesson. And today I'd particularly like to pray for Marcia Harris and her son. You know their circumstances, Lord. Families are requested by Johnston Nyanumba of Kenya, and Doris Frederick and her family ask for prayer, as does Olivet Nolan for her family as well. Victor, Maureen and Michaela from Kenya, Lord, Please bless each one of them as they study the word, but each one of us and our individual families around the world. May we, as we read, gain light that will be a blessing to those we live with day by day. And Lord, I'd like to pray for Karen Fierstein from Innsbruck, Austria, who's been listening for many years along with Marcus Quenza from Germany, who also has been listening for many years. Bless us now as we open your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Mark chapter 1 and verses 14 and 15. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Let's read that again, Mark 1, verses 14 and 15. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Who wrote the gospel of Mark, and why was it written? No gospel lists the name of the author. The one that comes the closest is John, with reference to the beloved disciple. As you read in John 21 verse 20, Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? And then in verse 24, This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that this testimony is true. However, from early times, each of the canonical Gospels has been associated with either an apostle, Matthew or John, or with a companion of an apostle. For example, the Gospel of Luke is linked with Paul, as we read in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 14, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. And Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. And Philemon verse 21 Sorry, verse 24 of chapter 1. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The Gospel of Mark is linked with Peter, as we read in 1 Peter 5 and verse 13. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Though the author of Mark never gives his name in the text, 
Early church tradition indicates that the author of the Gospel of Mark was John Mark, a sometime travelling companion of Paul and Barnabas, as you read in Acts 13, verses 2, while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And verse 5, when they arrived in Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. And later, an associate of Peter, as we read before, but let's read it again. First Peter 5.13 She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. The first step this week will be to learn about Mark as reported in Scripture, to see his early failure and eventual recovery. Then the study will turn to the opening section of Mark with a look forward to where the story is headed, and a look backward at why a failed and then restored missionary would write such a text. Sunday, March 30, The Failed Missionary Read Acts chapter 12, verse 12. How is Mark introduced in the book of Acts? Acts 12.12, 12. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. It seems probable that John Mark, the most likely author of the Gospel of Mark, was a young man when the events in Acts 12 occurred, probably in the A.D. mid-40s. He is introduced in verse 12 as the son of a woman named Mary. She was evidently a wealthy supporter of the church and held the prayer meeting at her home, made famous in Acts chapter 12. The story of Peter's escape from prison and the subsequent actions and then the death of Herod are replete with striking, even humorous contrasts between Peter and the king. John Mark does not really play any role in the story, but the introduction of him at this point prepares for his later connection with Barnabas and Saul. Read Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 5 and verse 13. How did John Mark get attached to Saul and Barnabas, and what was the outcome? Acts 13, beginning at verse 1. Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So, after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. And then verse 13, from Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. Acts 13 describes the first missionary journey of Saul and Barnabas, starting about AD 46. John Mark is not mentioned until verse 5, and his role is simply as a helper or servant. No other reference is made to the young man until verse 13, where the brief account notes that he returned to Jerusalem. No reason is given for his departure, and the absence of any description of his feelings or emotions leaves to the imagination what motivated his withdrawal from the missionary effort, which no doubt was filled with peril and challenges. Ellen G. White indicates in the Acts of the Apostles, page 169, that Mark, overwhelmed with fear and discouragement, wavered for a time in his purpose to give himself wholeheartedly to the Lord's work. Unused to hardships, he was disheartened by the perils and privations of 
the way, end of quote. In short, things simply got too hard for him, and so he wanted out. And so to finish the day, recall a time when you backed off from something or even flat out failed at it in your Christian walk. What did you learn from the experience? Monday, July 1, A Second Chance Read Acts chapter 15, verses 36 to 39. Why did Paul reject John Mark, and why did Barnabas give him a second chance? Acts 15, beginning at verse 36. Some time later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord, and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. The reason for Paul's rejection of the young man is given in Acts 15.38. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. Mark had withdrawn from them and had not continued in the work of ministry. Paul's attitude is understandable, if blunt. Missionary life, particularly in the ancient world, was rough and demanding, and we can compare that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 28. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have laboured and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides, Everything else, I face daily the pressures of my concern for all the churches. Paul depended on his fellow missionaries to help carry the burden of such challenging work and conditions. In his perspective, one who deserted so quickly did not deserve a place in a missionary team fighting hand-to-hand -hand against evil forces. Barnabas disagreed. He saw potential in Mark and did not want to leave the young man behind. Such a deep dispute arose between Paul and Barnabas over John Mark that they parted ways. Paul chose Silas to go with him and Barnabas took Mark. Acts does not explain why Barnabas chose to take Mark with him. In fact, this passage is the last place that the two men appear in Acts. But interestingly, it is not the last time Mark is mentioned in the New Testament. Read Colossians 4.10, 2 Timothy 4.11, Philemon 24 and 1 Peter 5.13. What details about Mark's recovery do these verses suggest? Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greeting, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. And 2 Timothy 4.11, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. And Philemon, verse 24, And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. And 1 Peter 5.13, she who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. An amazing transformation seems to have occurred in Mark. 
In these passages, Paul indicates the value of Mark to him and to ministry. Paul counts him as one of his fellow workers and wants Timothy to bring Mark with him. The book of 1 Peter indicates that Peter as well had a close relationship with Mark. These books by Paul and Peter were written likely in the early AD 60s, some 15 to 20 years after the experience in Acts 15. Mark clearly recovered from his failure, almost certainly through the trust that his cousin Barnabas placed in him. And so to finish the day, consider a time when you or a friend failed and were given a second chance. How did that experience change you and those who helped you? How did it modify your ministry to others? Tuesday, July 2, The Messenger Read Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. Who are the character in these verses, and what do they say and do? Mark 1, beginning at verse 1. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. These verses have three main characters. Jesus Christ, referred to in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, God the Father, implied in the words of verse 2, and John the Baptist, the messenger and preacher, who is to be the main subject of the last section of this passage. Mark 1, verses 2 and 3 contains a quotation from the Old Testament that Mark presents to describe what will happen in the story. What Mark quotes is a blending of phrases from three passages, Exodus 23.20, Isaiah 40, verse 3, and Malachi 3, verse 1. Read these three verses. What do these three passages have in common? First of all, Exodus 23, verse 20. See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. And Isaiah 40, verse 3, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And Malachi 3, verse 1, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Exodus 23.20 refers to an angel that God will send before Israel to bring them to Canaan. Isaiah 40 verse 3 speaks of God appearing in the wilderness with a highway prepared before him. And Malachi 3.1 speaks of a messenger going before the Lord to prepare his way. All three of these passages speak of a journey. The text in Isaiah has many ties with the ministry of John the Baptist and also focuses on the way of the Lord. In the Gospel of Mark, the Lord Jesus is on a journey. A fast-moving narrative enhances the sense of this journey, a journey that will lead to the cross and to his sacrificial death for us. But much must happen before he reaches the cross. The journey is just beginning. And Mark will tell us all about it. In keeping with the quotation from the Old Testament in Mark 1 verses 2 and 3, 
John the Baptist calls for repentance, a turning away from sin, and a turning back to God, as we read in verse 4. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Clothed like the ancient prophet Elijah, and let's have a look at that. Uh, in Second Kings 1 and verse 8, they replied, He had a garment of hair and had a leather belt around his waist. The king said, That was Elisha the Tishbite. He speaks in Mark 1 verses 7 and 8 about the one coming after him who is mightier than he. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. His statement that he is not worthy to loosen a strap of the coming one's sandals shows the exalted view he has of Jesus. Wednesday, July 3. Jesus' Baptism. Read Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 13. Who is present at the baptism of Jesus and what happens? Mark 1, beginning at verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. John baptizes Jesus in the Jordan River. As Jesus comes up out of the water, he sees the heavens being torn open and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. He hears the voice of God from heaven. You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased, in verse 11. These events point to the importance of Jesus' baptism. The Father, Son and Holy Spirit are present, together affirming the beginning of Jesus' ministry. The importance of this event will find its echo at the scene of the cross in Mark chapter 15. Many of the same elements of the story will recur in that scene. The Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness. The word drove is from the Greek word ekbalo, the common word used in the Gospel of Mark for driving out demons. The Spirit's presence here illustrates the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' life. The Lord is already starting the journey of his ministry and he immediately confronts Satan. The sense of the struggle in the scene is displayed by the reference to 40 days of temptation, the presence of wild animals and the angels ministering to Jesus. An unusual characteristic of the opening scene of the Gospel of Mark is that Jesus is presented as a character with both divinity and humanity. On the side of divinity, he is the Christ, the Messiah, as we read in verse 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, the Lord announced by a messenger, verses 2 and 3, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Mightier than John, verse 7, And this was his message, After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. The beloved son, of whom the Spirit descends in verses 10 and 11. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. But on the side of humanity, we see the following. 
he is baptized by John. Not the other way round, in verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. He is driven by the Spirit, in verse 12. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, tempted by Satan, in verse 13. And he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, the angels attended him with wild animals we've just read and ministered to by angels in the same verse. Why these contrasts? This points to the amazing reality of Christ, our Lord and Saviour, our God and yet also a human being, our brother and our example. How do we fully wrap our minds around this idea? We can't, but we accept it on faith and marvel at what this truth reveals to us about God's love for humanity. And so to finish the day, what does it tell us about the amazing love of God that, though Jesus was God, he would take upon himself our humanity in order to save us? Thursday, July 4, the Gospel according to Jesus. Read Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. What are the three parts of the Gospel message that Jesus proclaimed? Mark 1, beginning at verse 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Mark summarises here the simple and direct message of Jesus. Its three parts are illustrated in the following table. And the table has category on the left and content on the right. The first category is time prophecy. The first content is the time is fulfilled. The second category is covenant promise. The second content is the kingdom of God is near. The third category is call to discipleship. And the third content, repent and believe the gospel. Let me read that text again. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The time prophecy to which Jesus refers is the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9, verses 24 to 27. This prophecy finds fulfilment in the baptism of Jesus, where he is anointed with the Holy Spirit and begins his ministry. Daniel 9, beginning at verse 24. Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Know and understand this, from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven... He will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. And then Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. 
The amazing 70-week prophecy is illustrated in the following chart. And there's a chart here which shows the 69 weeks of that prophecy, or 483 literal years, beginning in 457 BC and ending in AD 27 when Jesus was baptised. Then there's the seven literal years that occurs after that, ending in AD 34, but in the middle is AD 31 with the cross. In this prophecy, one day stands for one year. As you read in Numbers 14, 34, for 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. And Ezekiel 4, verse 6, after you have finished this, lie down again, this time on your right side, and bear the sin of the people of Judah. I have assigned you forty days, a day for each year. The prophecy began in 457 BC with the decree issued by Artaxerxes, king of Persia, completing the work of restoring Jerusalem, as we see in Ezra chapter 7. And let's look at verse 11. This is a copy of the letter King Artaxerxes had given to Ezra the priest, a teacher of the law, a man learned in matters concerning the commands and decrees of the Lord for Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, teacher of the law of the God of heaven, greetings. Now I decree that any of the Israelites in my kingdom, including priests and Levites, who volunteer to go to Jerusalem with you may go. You are sent by the king and his seven advisers to inquire about Judah and Jerusalem with regard to the law of your God which is in your hand. Moreover, you are to take with you the silver and gold that the king and his advisers have freely given to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem, together with all the silver and gold you may obtain from the province of Babylon, as well as the free will offerings of the people and priests for the temple of their God in Jerusalem. With this money, be sure to buy bulls, rams, and male lambs, together with their grain offerings and drink offerings, and sacrifice them on the altar of the temple of your God in Jerusalem. You and your fellow Israelites may then do whatever seems best with the rest of the silver and the gold, in accordance with the will of your God. Deliver to the God of Jerusalem all the articles entrusted to you for worship in the temple of your God, and anything else needed for the temple of your God that you are responsible to supply, you may provide from the royal treasury. Now I, King Artaxerxes, decree that all treasures of trans-Euphrates are to provide with diligence whatever Ezra the priest, the teacher of the law of the God of heaven, may ask of you, up to a hundred talents of silver, a hundred cores of wheat, a hundred baths of wine, a hundred baths of olive oil, and salt without limit. Whatever the God of heaven has prescribed, let it be done with diligence for the temple of the God of heaven." Why should his wrath fall on the realm of the king of his sons? You are also to know that you have no authority to impose taxes, tribute or duty on any of the priests, Levites, musicians, gatekeepers, temple servants or other workers at his house of God. And you, Ezra, in accordance with the wisdom of your God, which you possess, appoint magistrates and judges to administer justice to all the people of trans-Euphrates, all who know the laws of your God, and you are to teach any who do not know them. Whoever does not obey the law of your God and the law of the king must surely be punished by death, banishment, confiscation of property, or imprisonment. Praise be to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, who has put it into the king's heart to bring honour to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem in this way, and who has extended his good favour to me before the king and his advisers and all the king's powerful officials, because the hand of the Lord was my God was on me. I took courage and gathered leaders from Israel to go up with me. Sixty-nine prophetic weeks would extend to A.D. 27, the time when Jesus was baptised and anointed with the Holy Spirit at the commencement of his ministry. His crucifixion would take place three and a half years later. 
Finally, the completion of the 70th week would occur in AD 37 when Stephen was stoned and the gospel message started going to the Gentiles as well as to the Jews. And so to finish today, when was the last time you studied the 70-week prophecy? How can knowing this prophecy help increase your faith not only in Jesus, but in the trustworthiness of the prophetic word? Friday, July 5. How fascinating that Revelation 14, 6 and 7, the first angel's message, parallels the gospel message of Jesus in Mark 1 and verse 15. Let's read those verses, Revelation 14, beginning at verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And Mark chapter 1 verse 15, The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. The first angel brings the everlasting gospel to the world in the last days in preparation for the second coming. Just like the message of Jesus, the angel's end-time gospel has the same three elements as illustrated in the table below. And in the table we have three columns. The first is the category, and that's time prophecy. And Daniel 9, the time is fulfilled. And Revelation 14, the judgment hour of Daniel 7 and 8. The next category is covenant promise. And in Mark 1, the kingdom is near, and in Revelation 14, the everlasting gospel. And the third category, call to discipleship. In Mark 1, it is repent and believe, and in Revelation 14, it is fear, glorify, worship God. The first angel's message announces the beginning of the pre-Advent judgment, which began in 1844 and was predicted in the 2,300-day prophecy of Daniel 8.14. He said to me, I will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. The judgment brings the kingdom of God to his persecuted people, we read in Daniel 7.22. Until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favour of the holy people of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. The first angel's call to fear, glorify and worship God is the call to discipleship issued to the world in the last days as the beast powers of Revelation 13 present a false god to fear, glorify and worship. Just as Jesus' message in Mark 1 is intimately tied to the prophecies of Daniel at the beginning of the Gospel proclamation, so the first angel's message is as well tied to Daniel at the close of earth's history. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Compare and contrast John the Baptist and Jesus in Mark 1, 1 to 13. What special lessons do you learn from the way they are presented? So, so we begin in Mark chapter 1. And verse 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the river Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. 
After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. And question two. Consider the meaning of baptism. Read Romans 6 verses 1 to 4 and John 3 1 to 8 and compare them with the baptism of Jesus in Mark 1 9 to 13. So we begin with Romans 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And John 3, beginning at verse 1. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. What parallels and contrasts do you see? How does this help you understand more clearly the meaning of baptism? And question number three. Compare and contrast the gospel according to Jesus in Mark 1, 14 and 15 and the first angel's message in Revelation 14, 6 and 7. First of all, we read Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And Mark 1, we compare verse 14 and 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. How does understanding these messages help you see better your mission for today? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Bewildered Shaman, Part 1 by Andrew McChesney. Father was the most prominent person in his small town in Nepal. Everyone sought his help. Townspeople believed that his animal sacrifices could cure any disease. Father came from a long line of shamans, and he became the shaman after the death of his father, who also was a shaman. Father believed his rituals wielded great power in the spirit world, so he was puzzled when he couldn't help the person whom he loved the most, his wife. He couldn't cure her or even diagnose her illness. 
He sacrificed a chicken, but her pain remained. He gave money to another shaman, but she lost weight. He took her to a physician, but she grew weaker. Father's bewilderment grew when his adult daughter, Divya, returned home to help her mother. He came home one day and couldn't find mother or Divya. Searching the house, he finally found them in an upstairs room, kneeling on the floor and talking to someone he couldn't see. Father was astonished. He suspected something was terribly wrong, but he quietly slipped out of the room so as to not disturb them. He wondered whether his daughter had secretly become a shaman like him. When he saw Divya later, he asked what she and mother had been doing. We were praying to my god to heal mother, Divya said. Which god, father asked. He worshipped many gods. To my god, Jesus, she said. I have left our family religion. I have found a new god in Jesus. She explained that her god created the heavens and the earth. If I pray, he will hear and heal mother, she said. Father didn't believe it. He didn't see how this god could be any more powerful than any of the family gods. When Divya needed to return to her home in another town, she asked to take mother with her. She is sick and you don't have time to take care of her because you are working, she said. I'll take her with me. Father, who worked both as a shaman and a construction worker, agreed. He was unable to help mother and he doubted that she would last long. She is your mother, he said. If she dies, let me know. Six months passed before father saw mother again. He travelled to Divya's house and was surprised to find mother healthy. He was full of questions. Why is mother well, he asked. What medicine did you give her? Divya replied that she had only prayed to God. God heard my request, she said. Now mother is well and happy and goes to church with me. Father didn't believe it. He laughed. He had never heard of such a God who healed without an animal sacrifice or another ritual.